Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the tutorial video for the Necron Overlord painting. I'm starting off here, as you can see, uh, just doing some value. Uh, this is sort of how I, s I sketch now. Rather than do a lot of line art, I'll just sort of do these large values. Um, you can see I do a little bit of sketching as I work, but really it's mostly just to figure out the composition on uh, where the characters will be sort of found within the composition in general. Uh, the details are going to come later. You can see on the top left of the screen I've got some reference going, just some stuff I snagged offline. And uh, the client was pretty pretty open. He knew the dynasty that he wanted his overlord to be from, uh, as well as that there had to be an ultramarine getting stomped on, uh, so that was no problem with me. And he wanted some monoliths uh, using their flux arc weapons. So those are really the constraints of this painting. So nice and open. And of course, if you're interested in uh, commissioning a painting, please feel free to email me at artist at nicholask.com. All right. So, in terms of the pose, uh, I used a lot. I got a lot of the inspiration from the miniature. Um, I kind of like the outstretched arm and the clawed hand look. So, I figured that would be a cool way to present this character. Um, here, I'm just adding some unnecessary details for this stage, but I have a problem not rendering out the face a little bit whenever I do a character. I'm not sure what it is, it's just I can't really accept a composition until I can see a face. Uh, I've been trying to stop that a little bit, but it's a really hard habit to break. Another part I'm doing, or another reason why I'm doing all these sketches is, is uh, to figure out really how this character is put together. Even though I have a, a photo of a miniature for reference, um, I don't have the actual miniature in front of me. So it's sort of hard to figure out exactly how a character like this is put together. I mean, he's fairly humanoid, but he's got these really distinctive designs in his armor and plating, and uh, he's a little more skeletal in that he doesn't have a fleshed out body in the same way the human character would. Uh, for the pose, I wanted something really menacing, sort of this looming, inevitable death. And the pose I ended up going with is just sort of this slow walk. Um, you know, the Overlord is hunched a little bit. Uh, he's got this kind of creepy skeletal claw hand, and then he's got his, uh, his I guess it would be a war scythe, um, or staff of flight. I'm not up on the... I'm not up on the current Necron rules, but uh, he's got his staff um, tilted downwards in a really imposing, threatening angle. Alright, so we're just using the uh, transform tool, a little tweak, and now we're going to start throwing in some some mid-ground for the Lord to stand on. It would have been much smarter to have kept things looser, but I get kind of carried away sometimes. Uh, like I said before, one of the clients requested details was that there'd be a mushroom cloud explosion, similar to the kind you'd find in the Dawn of War games. Um, I believe it's in Dark Crusade, where it's the expansion you can use the Necrons and fight against the Necrons. The monolith has this really cool effect where it fires its uh, flux arc, and um, I think that's what it's called. It's this just giant kind of lightning bolt that comes out of the monolith, um, which has this enormous mushroom cloud explosion. So I was happy to oblige. Uh, now I'm, I started fooling around with the Space Marine, um, and this was a really awkward and terrible pose. So 
it's not going to last for too long. And that's fine. It's totally okay to mess around with your composition. You shouldn't expect to get it right on the first try. Um, you know, in very few exceptions uh, will I get a composition right on the first try. You know, if maybe if I think about a painting all day, I, I might be able to pull it off, but usually I have to do some thumbnails, or in this case, I'll just do a digital sketch, and I'll mash it up and fool around with it and try to figure out what I want it to look like. And of course, it has to be obvious that this marine is an ultramarine, the internet's least favorite space marine chapter. If you're not familiar with the reason behind that, well, go to, or just Google ultramarines, and I'm sure you'll find some. <laughs> they're, 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 <laughs> it's sort of ironic. They're the most popular, but at the same time, the most hated. I think it's they're the most hated because they're so popular. That, and of course, um, they're heavily favored by Games Workshop, which I, I can't really fault Games Workshop for. They're sort of the most heroic of the Space Marine chapters. They're the very vanilla sort of um, generic chapter compared to the others, which are considered deviants in the uh, story of the game. But anyway, uh, what I'm doing now is I'm just sort of adding volume via lighting. Uh, it's how I try to figure out the space of a character. Some people use line. I like to use value because I know that if I use line I'm going to have to paint it out later. And that's just going to add time that I don't have. Uh, this painting took 16 hours as is. So if I had done line work it would have taken, I don't know, maybe 32 maybe. So no thank you. I'll, I'll stick with doing the way I've been doing it lately. <laughs> Um, some people ask me what kind of brushes I'm using. I use just a round brush. You can see at the top left of the video. I just use the number one round brush from the menu, and, and then I just use the sliders to adjust the scale. That's all it is. I usually paint with around 70 to 90% opacity, uh, especially in the sketch phases. And the coloring, I usually, I usually go around 95%. Um, the reason I don't go 100% is because you get some really interesting textures when you use a 95% or a 90% brush. Um, since you're not painting at 100% 100, 100 opacity, your image isn't going to be uniform. There's going to be little kind of blips of uh, transparency and differences between the multiple strokes. So uh, yeah, it's, it's just a neat way to add a little bit of texture and detail inadvertently without spending a lot of time. So here we are, still figuring out the volumes of the Marine's armor and his power pack. I've become very comfortable at painting Space Marine armor at this point. It's uh, the thing I paint the most, I think, nowadays. Alright. So as you can see, um, every time I, I make a new kind of, I like to call them sort of forays or explorations. Whenever I have a new idea or something I want to try out, I'll create a new layer and paint there. And if I don't like it, I'll just delete it. And if I do like it, I'll leave it and then paint another layer. And as you can see in my layer menu now, I only have two layers. Um, that's because every once in a while, I'll do an iterative save. What that means is that my first file version will be called, you know, Necron Overlord underscore zero zero one. Next time I save it, it'll be Necron Overlord underscore zero zero two, and so on and so forth. Uh, the reason I do this is that if the file were to be corrupted, I have backups. I have versions that might not be that far back, or whatever. Also, if I make a lot of changes and then I don't like it, and my history doesn't allow for me to fix it, I can always just reload. Um, and lastly, of course. I don't want to have 300,000 layers. So what I do is I'll make a, lo a lot of layers as I work, and then I'll collapse it and make an iterative save, save it as something else. So I still have all that information from before when I saved, but now I don't have to worry about a million layers. I just paint on new layers over it. Make sense? OK. And as you can see right there, I'm resizing the shoulder pads to be more scale to the miniatures. Space Marines have gigantic pauldrons, as they're known. And 
and doing some Space Marine Gauntlets. This actually was tough, um, mostly because I couldn't find really that much great reference for a flag being held this way. Um, I probably should just take a picture of myself, but I live alone, so it would have been difficult to photograph my hand accurately. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's hard to just find people to say, hey, I want to come over and hold a flag for me, and then peace out. So I had to sort of figure it out, try to get some reference online, etc. I think I did a good job. I'm quite happy with it. And if you haven't guessed, this is a Space Marine standard bear, um, Ultramarine standard bear. Uh, what I'm doing really quickly there, by the way, is there's a hotkey, which is, I believe, Control J or Control Shift J. I think it's Control J. But what it does is, if you have a selection on a layer, it'll duplicate that selection within the last cell. Uh, the reason this is useful, and it'll, it'll do it on a new layer. Um, the reason this is useful is because if you just hit Control C and Control V, it won't paste it where the last cell is necessarily. It'll paste it in the middle of the painting. So it's fine if you're importing something from another document, but if you're trying to fix an area of your painting and you need it to be exactly where it was before, you just want to transform it a little bit, Control c Control v is a little bit harder to use. It's much easier just to do Control-J, or I think it's Control-Shift-J. I can't remember right now off the top of my head. Um, anyway, uh, now we're doing the gorget of the Ultramarine. The gorget is the part of the armor that surrounds the neck. Uh, if you're going to do Marines or Knights, it's a good idea to get some reference material on medieval armor just so that you have the right vocabulary. Also, you can play World of Warcraft or some other MMOs or games because that's a good way to learn it too, I'm not going to lie. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm using, I think it's an Ivy brush. I think I got it from Darken a couple of years ago. Um, but it's really quick. I don't, like I said, custom brushes are really useful, but they're useful when they're used correctly. You can't just use them straight up. You have to alter them or blend them into your painting to make them more believable. So what I did there was I just laid down some really quick ivy using the brush and then I went back in with the eraser and a brush and kept what I wanted and took out what I didn't. Uh, you'll notice a little mistake here which gets fixed later but for all you hardcore 40k fans you will know that the chapter symbol goes on the marine's left shoulder pad not his right. Details like this are important, especially if you want to do commercial art for uh, well, anyone who has Games Workshop IPs, whether it's Games Workshop, Black Library, Forge World, or Fancy Flight Games. Um, that stuff does matter a lot. So detail is really important when you're painting. Make sure to have good reference and to know your business. So what I'm doing here is I'm on using a normal layer, round brush, 20% it looks like 20%-ish opacity, and I set the brightest bright where I know the, the sun or the light source will be hitting the armor the strongest, and then I just fade it out using the eyedropper, 20%, 40% opacity, depending on what I need. I don't like to use the blend tool. I really don't recommend it. Um, it makes your painting look really digital. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, anyone can use the, the blend tool. It doesn't take skill to use it. What takes skill is using digital tools like that and not letting people know. Um, I find the best way to use renders or special effects or tools that are really kind of well known is to use them in such a way that it's difficult to tell how you did it. Um, it will take either an industry expert or a fellow artist or someone who's familiar with your work to figure it out. And that's the sign of a good use of the tool. If someone, you know, whether it's just a casual observer or someone who has some familiarity with Photoshop or whatever, looks at your painting and says, oh, well, that's that's the cloud render tool, that's the blur, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. You're not doing a good job. You're not doing it right. Um, filters are way overused, so... Be wary about using them. Use them sparingly, and when you do use them, make sure you cover your tracks. Alright, so what I'm doing now is 
detailing the ultramarine. Um, remember what I said before about not overindulging detail, worrying about the composition first? Yeah. Sometimes I don't listen to my own advice while I work. So listen to what I'm saying, not what I'm doing necessarily is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'm aware that's horrendously hypocritical, but it's the truth. Um, sometimes I wish I had someone to coach me while I'm working because I'll get lost in a painting and I'll forget what I'm doing and I'll start detailing the crap out of something when I really should be worrying about composition. Uh, so anyway, with that uh, admitted and off my chest, I'll continue with what I was talking about. Um, so here I'm just detailing the ultramarine, um, just doing some little engraving work. Uh, You'll notice that on the embossed shoulder pad, I'm sorry, the pauldrons, or along the rim of the pauldron, there's some scrawled, indecipherable writing. Uh, the way I did that was a combination of a layer with a drop shadow. Yes, drop shadow is useful if used correctly. It's not going to fool anybody if you just throw it on standard style. You have to tailor it to your needs. Um, so I do a layer of that, I drop down the opacity, and I do more squiggles on top. And you get this nice sort of you can't tell whether it's engraved or if there's a pattern or if it's just beat copper or what the deal is, but it looks really nice. All right, so now we're doing the Space Marines greaves and some of the uh, undersuit peeking through the gaps. And we'll do some piping. And not piping in the sense of military dress uniforms, but piping in the sense of actual pipes under the armor. There's this really awkward area on Space Marines, um, the abdominal area, because Space Marines have these gigantic torsos, and there's this big gap between the torso and the belt area, which is sort of hard to fill. Uh, artistically. On the miniature, it's just sort of this little squished area because they use heroic scale, they don't use true scale. Um, so for artists doing a more painterly realistic uh, realistic fantasy style of work, you have to figure out something to put there. So I've become very uh, accustomed to using gut plates, as I like to call them, which are sort of these giant belt buckly things that guard their guts. Um, what I just did there was I created the ultramarine uh, chapter icon and then I used a warp tool uh, to make it match the curvature of the gut plate. And here I am adding some uh, details to the ultramarine chapter icon because I can't help myself. I'm dangerous when it comes to detail work because I get lost. I can ha I can go for hours and hours doing detail work. Um, <laughs> it's just too fun. I can't help it. And now it looks like I'm adding a skull here. This guy apparently is highly decorated in his chapter. And I, uh, I got inspired by the Space Hulk miniatures. They have um, this one Terminator who's really cool. He's a, he's got a power fist, which if you're not familiar with the game, is this giant gauntlet that can pretty much tear through most things. Um, and uh, his power fist has this little plate that slides open, and there's sort of this little motion scanner and buttons and communications array built into his forearm guard, and I thought that was totally sweet. So I wanted this guy to have a little bit of that going on. And there it is. Alright, so we're embossing and adding details now. Little pinprick highlights. And purity seals forever. And the way I made that purity seal was just a custom brush. Really straightforward, really quick. And what I'm doing now is, what I'll do is I'll duplicate the purity seal layer, and then I'll lock the opacity, which is that little checkered box, as you can see in the layers it's selected right now, it's the first of those little menu items, 
And what that does is you can only affect the pixels within that layer. So if you paint with a brush, it will only paint those pixels. And you can never go more opaque or less opaque than you started. So if you try to erase, it will instead brush with your secondary color in your palette. It's a really useful tool um, for highlighting like leaves and cloth and stuff that's really thin or sharply edged and is difficult to highlight without thickening out. So that's where I like to use it um, a lot. All right, and there's a wax seal I used for reference because that's how you do it. Wax seals are actually pretty sweet. Um, I highly suggest you check them out. Signet rings and all that jazz are pretty awesome. And uh, when in doubt, if you're doing 40k art, add a skull. One thing I've noticed about some 40k art is uh, purity seals are often painted in a sort of bubblegum fashion, <laughs> where they're kind of these really opaque, light-colored red splotches, which is really not what wax is. It's sort of high-gloss, fairly dark, um, somewhat transparent material, which has some subsurface scattering and is really interesting to paint. So that's something I've been trying really hard to show in my paintings when I can. It's also mech it's also really messy. Wax seals are not neat. They're not perfectly round. They usually get some spillage and bubbling over and stuff. Anyway, uh, end of rant. Now I'm doing this sort of neat, uh, I guess, metal on his chest, sort of like an icon for his lanyards. Uh, I'm using this other piece of Ultramarine's art for reference, as you can see. Symbols of the Honor Guard. And here's the lanyard. I really like doing Marines who are totally decked out. Um, I know the miniatures aren't usually that detailed. I mean, they can't. There's just the scale. There's no way. But, uh, when you're scaling up something to real scale, you have to add details that you can sort of imagine are there on a mi small miniature, but you, you need to give the viewer something to look at. So I like to really just go crazy with details on Space Marines, you know, purity seals and metals and lanyards and tassels and cloaks and all types of fun little details on their armor. And rather than use the ivy brush, I decided to hand paint some ivy here. Not actual ivy, just sort of the stylized laurel. And the reason I'm painting this on a layer with a layer mask is in order to make these ivy or sorry laurel patterns look right on the armor I have to be able to erase them out and I don't want to lose them the, the data there in case I have to make changes later so what I do is I use a layer mask and I can paint them out using the mask rather than just the actual erase tool I try to avoid the erase tool if I can I like to paint over or use masks I don't like to delete stuff that I've used and here we go adding the complimentary little etchings and oaths and whatnot. For those who don't know, Space Marines love taking oaths of battle and stuff right before they go into combat, so they'll put purity seals on them and oath scrolls, and they'll make little carvings into their armor to commemorate victories or remind them of whatever. So those are fun details that are common on Space Marines, especially Black Templars. Black Templars are crazy for that stuff. Here's a fun trick. If you don't feel like painting a monolith, because there's a lot of details to keep, what you can do is you can desaturate it, run it through a couple filters really quickly, distort it, mess with the contrast, 
and voila, you can import monoliths into your painting pretty quickly. This is really useful if you have to use something that's on scale or on model and uh, has a lot of details that can get easily messed up, especially in perspective. So what I did here was just that trick a couple times. Um, and then I made sure, of course, to make each of them a little bit different, do tweaks on them, and as always, you have to relight them to match the lighting of the scene. That's the most important part. All right, so we've got some studs. We've got the crystals are getting painted in to be really glowy and nice. I like it. Just using normal layers still. Part of the reason I like to do everything in monochrome uh, when I am figuring out my painting is it's just so much less to keep track of. Colors just colors have inherent values, and you start thinking about your color schemes and stuff. Where if you do everything in monochrome, aka black and white. Uh, there's just not really that much to worry about. You can just say, okay, well, this is too bright and this is too dark, so I'll fix it. You don't have to worry about, well, what does the hue look like here? Is the saturation okay? So anyway, that's why I do things the way I do them. And as you can see, um, I'm detailing these so they're not just rip-offs. They're actually detailed and relit to be accurate and reflect the scene even going so far as to lower the gates on the portals. Pretty sweet, right? Oh geez, alright, so now it's time to go back to the Necron Overlord and give him some TLC. Uh, this part I remember took a very long time, mostly because I couldn't get the mask or his faceplate right. Uh, the big problem was that the miniature, the reference I had on the miniature anyway, half of his face is obscured, so I couldn't really tell what the bottom half looked like. Um, also, Necrons are depicted sort of differently in the artwork than they are in the miniatures, and I didn't want to go one way or the other, I sort of wanted a happy medium. So right now he's got a faceplate which is very on model for the miniature. It's just this kind of death mask. And that's fine, but it really wasn't doing it for me. It just sort of was this... I mean, it looked cool, but it, it just wasn't what I wanted. So once I... I mean, I, th I thought I was done with it at this point, but no. I'm going to go back and uh, edit it quite a bit before this is through. But anyway... Right now I'm just sort of figuring out the rest of his armor, building up his shoulder pads, and uh, fleshing things out. Uh, it was definitely fun to do a Necron Overlord. Um, I've only painted Necrons once before, and that was in the Massacre at Sanctuary 101, which is, uh, you can see online on my YouTube channel. There's a tutorial and a speed paint available for that. Um, so yeah, make sure to check those out. But right now, uh, this was the second time I painted Necrons, and I, I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, they've got some fun details that I don't get to do very often. I do a mostly Imperial, you know, Space Marines, Sisters of Battle, Imperial Guard, etc. Um, so when I get the opportunity to do Xenos, or Aliens, such as Necrons, or Eldar or whatever, it's always really welcome because they get these really fun stylistic uh, differences, which are great. I really like them. I mean, I love the Imperial look. Don't get me wrong, it's my favorite. But it's fun to do something different once in a while. Um, Necrons have this sort of cyborg, well, not cyborg, but cyber Egyptian look, um, as well as, you know, obviously this whole tomb thing going on. They're all very skeletal and dead looking, but not dead in a zombie way, dead in a sort of lifeless, metallic, terminator way. So think Terminator, the movie, but spacefaring and Egyptian, and you have Necrons. Oh, and there's lots of them. There's not just one. And they have vehicles. So they're sort of the same, but not really. Games Workshop did a really good job uh, 
distinguishing them from the Terminator franchise, I must say. Here I'm doing this nice marbling on the armor. Um, it's not really clear whether they use marble on their armor as a decorative element or if it's some other material that has veins in it or what the deal is, but I really liked it so I wanted to make sure it was there. Very on model. Ooh, so his gorget was uh, pretty difficult actually to figure out. Took a couple tries. There are these interesting lights kind of built into um, the armor, and they're sort of difficult to figure out spatially. Alright, so here we are. We're uh, beefing up the Overlord. We're really pushing his uh, dimensions here. You know, he's got a really big skeletal barrel rib cage, which is really cool. Um, I really didn't want him to look effeminate. I wanted him to be clearly masculine. But that's difficult to do with skeletons because skeletons are sort of asexual. Um, I mean, there's always the hip ratio, but their hips are going to be more pronounced because they don't have abdominals. You know, they just have a spine. Still using normal layers, still using the round brush, painting an opacity varying between 40 and 60%. And you'll notice I'm painting over some of the details, uh, such as these, I don't really know how to describe them. They look kind of like robes, but they're made of plated metal. Um, I'm going to paint over those for now. I haven't forgotten about them. I'm just painting over them for now. The reason is, if I try to not paint over them and avoid that area, I'm not going to see the ribs completely, and I'm going to have to make guesses about if they look right. Whereas if I paint over those areas and then paint them back in later, I can make sure that everything looks right volumetrically and that things are sort of correctly in perspective. Which they are, so I'm happy. What I was saying about detailing Space Marines goes for every other type of character that's in a miniature format. Um, sculptors only have so much space and the molds are only so accurate. So a lot of small details just sort of get lost or are skimmed over. Uh, this is apparent in the Necron Overlord miniature. You can see at his wrist there's really just two pipes um, that connect his uh, kind of forearm guard to his wrist. And I thought that was, I mean it looks great on the miniature, but for a painting like this it's just going to look kind of too simple. So I added some secondary little piston-y type deals, and I'm going to break them up a little bit just so there's more detail. Doing the gauntlet here. Actually, I went a little bit crazy on the highlights. I was having um, too much fun adding the volume and whatnot, and I ended up making it too bright. Uh, so we're going to have to go back later and darken it up a little bit. As you can see, the reason it's too bright is because, A, it's one of the closer objects in the composition, and there's a heavy sort of misty fog going on. So closer objects need to be darker. The further something away is, it's uh, going to be lighter. Secondly, the 
gauntlet, I guess, the claw, is right in front of a giant lightning bolt. And you can't have a light on top of a light. You have to have a, a dark on top of a light or a mid-tone. Having a light on a light, you just get lost. You lose sense of where things are spatially. So remember that. Working on the, uh, the thigh here. And adding some more little details to the uh, Overlord. Sometimes you have to just make stuff up. There's, there isn't always going to be a perfect reference for everything. So try to observe the design elements that are already present and then incorporate them into your design when you extrapolate, shall we say, what might be there. So everything's going smoothly so far. I tend to get fairly detailed. I know a lot of artists like to keep things a little bit more loose. Um, I wish I had the confidence to do that. I actually sort of go to detail as a crutch just because it's something I've been doing for so long. Um, that and some of the art directors I work with prefer more detail over less, which makes sense if you think about it because you know they want the more bang for their buck. But uh, it's difficult for me to break away from these sort of highly rendered detailed images at this point in my career, unless I'm doing personal work. Time to resize stuff using the Control J feature again. Ah, yes, this is when I decide that the hips look too effeminate. I decide to narrow them out a little bit, straighten them, making them more masculine looking. Also, to break up the little thin skeletal waist. I did some uh, piping hanging down from his uh, rib cage. Gotta love symmetry. All right, now we're doing the loin clothy type thing, tabard or whatever you want to call it. Um, just sort of this nice decorative element. And it's useful because it saves me time. All right, so now I think this is the beginning of when I start fumbling with the face for the next million hours. Um, faces are 
really, really important. The most important parts of a painting, or at least a character in a painting, are hands and face. You can get away with a murder on the rest, but the hands and the face have to be right. People naturally look at those first, so they are the areas that need to be the most detailed, the most accurately rendered, and the best lit. Doing some nice rendering, a little bit of highlighting, all on normal layers, all using the round brush, varying opacities, somewhere between 30 and 90 percent. It really depends how strong I need it to be. Just doing some shading now, looks like 70-ish percent, 70 to 90 percent uh, brush stroke opacity. Changing the head design a little bit now. I mean, it, it's super on model. Don't get me wrong, um, but I just wasn't happy with it. You're going to see there's a lot of iterations of faces done here, and then heads. Um, it's funny because I'll fix one part of the face, and then the other part starts looking wrong because it's stylistically different. So I have to go and fix the other part of the face. In this case, the head was too big and unrealistic. And then the symbol was too small. And then the head was too thin. Etc. Etc. This goes on for a while. So get ready, sit back, have fun. You're gonna see a lot of iterations of a Necron Lord Overlord's face. Sunken eyes, larger eyes, smaller eyes, stronger highlights. Eventually I dug up another piece of reference uh, painted by the incredible Adrian Smith for the codex of the cover of the Codex Necrons. Um, and I used that as reference a little bit. But the problem with his stuff was that it was it's very it's amazing artwork for sure. But it's not on model as much. I mean they look like skulls. Um, and Necrons have more sort of stylized skulls in my taste, so I didn't want it to be a skull made of metal. It's not what it looks like. It's a stylized, uh, kind of elongated and narrowed skull. <clears throat> Fancy up the head design. And then it turned out the head was too small. Uh, when I work on something and constantly revise it, I generally make it too small because I'll keep chipping away at it subtractively. And when I'm done, I'll say, yay, it's perfect. And then I'll realize it's, it's uh, half the size it needs to be. Just doing some more work on the gorget, a little uh, liquify tool. And once again, changing the head design. Uh, at this point, I went around and I started detailing the armor, because I figured enough is enough. I started adding little bits of data here and there about the armor's construction and how he moves and how the armor just works in general, which is always fun. 
and important. Details like that help to sell the character. I actually really like the way the head looks right now, but I thought the lighting was more was stronger on it. But um, sorry, it's not the final one that ends up getting used. And here I'm adding more of the little Necron symbols all over the place, and changing the face again. And adding these little kind of crucifixy type lights and rib lights and stuff. Time to paint these guys back in. They sort of remind me of like really long scarves. <laughs> Or uh, those things that priests wear. I don't remember what they're called. But yeah, these things were fun to paint. They're sort of like these long... They remind me of the uh, ivy from Soul Calibur's sword a little bit. got these giant chest discs, not nipple discs, chest discs, we'll say, that hold them to the uh, rib cage. And uh, why not add some circuitry, little doodads to the rest of the armor. Here I'm helping to define the form of these guys by doing the little highlights and shadows. You can see that there's a kind of ridge down their middle and the top half is facing the light source more than the bottom half, etc. So you get an idea of where they are in space, which is important, as well as how thick they are, and, you know, how much weight they have. They're able to be moved by the wind in him walking, but they're not so light that they're flapping in the breeze. They've got some density and weight to them. Guess it's time to do the second shoulder pad. It's been waiting quite patiently in the background. detail, more detail, get fun stuff going on, some uh, shoulder joints and some van braces, some coiling around the elbow and all types of fun stuff.
I used to hate doing cylinders, but especially metallic ones, but once you get the hang of it, they're really actually rewarding to do. Um, pretty much the way you do a highly polished, nearly chrome metal is uh, you do it sort of like a neutral tone, and then you do a very strong highlight closer to the light source. Then you get a terminus, which is the uh, the strongest point of the shadow, which is about two-thirds of the way down. So if you imagine it as a gradient, you have your strongest point that fades, and then it gets really dark, and then you have a bounce light at the bottom, which redeems it. And the bounce light is never as strong as the top light. Um, or, I mean, unless you have an equally strong bounce light, but normally it's about a half to a third as strong. And that's how you get a nice cylindrical, at least convincing cylindrical looking metal object. And now we're working on the cape. The Necron Overlord's cape is not really a cloth cape as much as a series of interlocking plates, sort of like his front thingies that hang off his chest. Um, but uh, just a whole lot more of them, really. Also, it was nice to have a dark form so that I could further draw the... I need to make up a name for these, but the thing hanging off his chest. Uh, see how much contrast it gets now against the darkness of the cape? And the cape itself is silhouetted against the explosion. Multiple layers of brightness. Oh, yeah. Silhouettes on silhouettes. And these I kept pretty simple. And I wish I could have done more of the painting like this, because I really like how they came out. Just these sort of volumeless shapes, these planes of light. Alright, so we're doing the Staff of Light, I guess. I think this is a Staff of Light. Once again, I apologize. I'm not up to date on Codex Necron's uh, war gear. But it's either a Staff of Light or a War Scythe. So looks like a Staff of Light to me. So we're going to go with Staff of Light. Uh oh, back to the face. So now you can see that I'm using Adrian Smith's painting as reference, and it's gonna look very Adrian Smith in a second, because it's almost a duplicate. And I didn't really like that idea, um, so it doesn't stick around. Because there's, I mean, copying is copying, so don't copy. But it's tough not to get a similar looking product in the end if you're working from a model that you're sharing with another artist. And like I said, if you look at the miniature I used for reference and then the cover art, the cover art's incredible, but it's not quite on model in terms of the reference material. It has its own Adrian Smith style. Adrian likes to use these really sharp lines, which I love. Um, but uh, as you can see, that's not quite how the actual miniature looks. And those damn cheeks would just not give me a break. I could not get them right. It took me a long time. Uh -huh. In the end, I actually used one of my favorite tricks, which I'll explain when I get there in the recording. But uh, sometimes when I work on something, especially faces, I'll do multiple layers. And each layer is a different version that I paint on top of the previous layer. And the reason I do that is so that if I don't like it, I can turn it off and I just have that original underneath. Right? Seems easy. But there's another reason you can use it, which is sometimes I'll like this face a little bit, and I'll like this face a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll stack the layers, and then I'll reduce the opacity of each layer until I get a composite face <laughs> from all the different layers. And uh, that's what I ended up doing here, and I think it looked pretty sweet. So that's what I ended up doing. And then I just have to go back and solidify them. It tends to get a little bit sort of fuzzy, so you have to go back and pick out the stuff you really like. But uh, it works for me. It's a technique I've used in the past and uh, I still use now.
So here I'm painting lots of shiny metal cylinders, like you do when you do Necrons. Um, a little bit of a complex shape, really, though. There's a lot going on. There are these bisected cylinders of varying sizes with these blades coming out. So a lot of things to keep in mind. And all of it has to be in perspective, of course. Perspective is always important. Should have done a war scythe. War scythes are sweet. Not that Staff of Light isn't cool, but war scythes are just totally sweet. I don't even care, who knows? I love them. So you can see here that I've left an edge uh, in shadow, and on the other side I've left the, the edge in highlight. Um, so this gives some thickness to the blade, a little bit of volume. And then to reiterate the actual surface, I go in and I sort of etch these details into it, just using a normal layer. Ta-da! Working on that blade, doing some circuitry, making it look Egyptian and Necron. Just normal layers, as always. And here I checked the perspective, um, and it was off because I just did a quick sketch before. So when you're doing it, things that are straight and they're in perspective, double, chip, uh, double triple check. Make sure that everything's right because if you add details and then realize it's not right, whew, you are not going to be having fun. You're going to have to fix all your details in perspective, which is a big time sink. So doing pretty much the same thing we did on the head of the weapon to the tail. Adding thickness, adding some etching, blah blah blah. Making sure it's clear that the light source is reflected in it. And time for a custom brush because that's how we save time. So I have a custom brush that I use when I need ribbing done or repetitive patterns in a curve. Ta-da! All I'm doing is using the pen tool, stroking it, and then I go in and I edit out the stuff I don't want using a mask, and that's it. And now I have some lovely uh, little patterns on the staff is on the staff script that are all in perspective and perfectly in a row, and I could not ask for more. Whereas if I tried to do it by hand, it would take a long time, and it would never be quite right. They'd always be a little bit off. So use Photoshop when you can. Use its, at least its digital tools when you can, because they can save you a lot of time. Um, now I'm adding some Necron Warriors, a Phalanx, stepping out of the portal in the front of the monolith because they can do that, or at least they could last edition. I don't know about this edition. Probably. Um, and it's a very fluffy, awesome Necron idea of this portal coming out of a building where just infinite supplies of guys walk out. There's legions of Necron warriors. So, I wanted it, and there it is. And what's also nice is that I can pump out these figures and just by using a little bit of value, you know, some highlights on the shoulders, head, and some glowing eyes, and the gauze rifles with their glowing chambers, you get an idea that there's a lot of dudes there, and I spent a lot of time painting it. But really, I didn't spend that much time. But it works. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm adding some atmospheric perspective to these guys. The reason I'm doing that is they should not be darker 
than the rear foot of the Necron Lord. Um, otherwise, it's going to look wonky. So, as things go further into the distance away from the viewer, they become less contrasted, less saturated, generally more blue, but not necessarily, and lighter. Unless it's a night scene, in which case they just sort of fade out. But, uh, yeah, that's called aerial perspective. Um, not bird's eye, there's a difference. Aerial perspective is when uh, objects fade into the distance. And it is very helpful when painting because it indicates distance um, very easily. And saves you time because things in the distance shouldn't be that rendered out. And if you're rendering them out, then you're wasting time. It's also a really good way to demonstrate scale. If something is really big and you paint it with a lot of aerial perspective, it means it's huge in reality, like ridiculously large. doing some kind of loose canyons in the background. And uh, now we're going to work on the mushroom cloud. So I had a sort of cartoony stand in mushroom cloud, which is these two giant swirls like you might see if you were to flick soapy water. And uh, adding some clouds and noise to the sky as well as some sweet glow effects to the power cores or crystals or whatever sit inside the monolith. Necrons love crystals and science. <laughs> For being an undead, spacefaring undead race, they do love science. Which I respect. How's that for cartoony? I give it like a literal mushroom neck, but uh, I thought it looked better if it was sort of a little bit more droopy and sort of swaying, sort of not an immediate mushroom cloud, but the sort of drifting one. And we're painting in behind the overlord since this explosion and the lightning arc are both behind him. Fun stuff. And of course, we get some electrical discharge since it's a lightning bolt causing this mushroom cloud. Why not? We get some fun little radiant lightning. Usually, I'd use a lightning brush, but uh, eh, lightning's fun to paint by hand sometimes once you know how to do it. Doing some detailing on the Ultramarines power plant backpack. And uh, having a sweet lightning strike on that monolith in the background. Totally sweet. And fun. Fun to do. Lightning is fun. Some angry little storm clouds break up the sky. To further isolate the silhouette of the Overlord, I'm painting in some light behind him. This will help separate him from the midground and background and make him pop a little bit more on the canvas. It also helps from get, keeping him from uh, getting lost against the details. Pretty sweet, right? As you can see, I'm trying to avoid tangents or lines that almost touch but don't quite. Those are not pretty, and the eye does not like seeing them. So, avoid tangents when you can. Try to have these sort of neutral shapes that overlap but never really quite. 
uh, like meet up on their lines and edges because it does not look good. And I'm adding a little monolith to the background um, just so you can see that there, there's an army in a valley below. And here are some of these Necron flyers that just came out. I thought they'd be cool if we added them in. Just pasting and transforming them and then re-highlighting them. And they were fun. Fun to do. Little squadrons of these guys. And I did I did use the blur tool on them just to give them a little bit of motion blur, but I didn't want to go nuts. I wanted them still to be clear, but I thought it would be nice if they had a little bit of zoom. And it didn't seem right to not have some Necrons closer up. There's just kind of this big negative space. So just some quick silhouette Necrons here. Because you're dead. You're dead, Ultramarine. It's over. Give up. Give him a little bit of swagger. One shoulder leaning forward. And he's got friends. And I'm using a darken layer here so I can paint right over the Overlord without worrying because these are lighter shades, lighter values. So darken layers are amazing. Also, don't worry, my tutorial uh, on layer types is written. I just need to record it. So that'll be coming out soon. Um, I have a lot of freelance work right now, so that's what's been keeping me busy. But soon, soon you'll have your layer to type tutorial. It's it's gonna be long. There are a lot of layer types. I didn't even realize until I started writing the tutorial. But I care, so I'll teach you about them. And I'll teach you about which ones I use most. All right, here we are, adding some more foggy aerial perspective and highlights to the ground as it goes further away from the space rain. Makes sense. Pushes the Necron Lord back spatially a little bit. And at this point I decided it would be a good idea to change the position of the helmet. So we did. Using Control J and then painting out the details that we didn't like and adding new ones. Also, it's time to battle damage the crap out of the Space Marine. He's too clean. He's got scratches and dents, but we want more. This guy's done. So, time to add some damage to him. Like that. Bam! Part of your pauldron's missing, sucker. And kazow. You've got holes in your uh, breastplate. And... Ding! Damage to your forearm. What are you going to do? So yeah, battle damage is good. It helps tell the story. You can tell this marine has seen better days. He's got some giant gouges in his ceramite armor. Yet somehow the purity seals never get ripped off or burned. I never understood that. So yeah, his armor's all cracked and dinged and nicked and scratched and dented and torn up. Whereas the Necrons are all squeaky clean because they are trouncing them. They're trouncing the Ultramarines. They're just totally overrunning them. We even cracked his helmet so you can see more of the lens than normally would be visible. And... uh Space Marines come with frag and crack grenades, so I might as well throw one of them in. This is when I realized that the shoulder pad was wrong, so uh, I gave him a skull. I, You'll love this. I referenced my Codex Space Marines, as well as my Heraldry of the Space Marines book from Games Workshop, and got a nice skull design from there to paint, since skulls represent headquarters choices or HQs, which blah blah blah, nerdy nerdy stuff, which uh, Honor Guard 
and standard bearers belong to. So he has a skull because that's what he would have if he was on the tabletop. And we're doing a frag grenade or a fragmentation grenade, which is in the traditional pineapple style. And uh, making the lens a little bit more gem-like, as they're usually shown on the models. And when in doubt, more dings and scratches, more dents in the armor. Ooh, that's a nasty one. Man, this armor is really messed up. These are really easy to do. Uh, all you have to do is a little bit of shadow, a little bit of highlight, and you've got a dent. Just think about where the light source is coming from. Have the dent, uh, the darker side of the dent, be closer to the light source because that would be the part that's in shadow. And then the further part is more in highlight because it would be catching the light more readily. And his totally sweet wrist communicator is busted and shattered. Sad story. And his flag has seen better days. It's got tears in it. It's kind of looking a little bit threadbare. There's little strings loose. Ooh, color time. Now, I had a request for a certain dynasty, and I intend to make that request happen. So this dynasty, I think it's like the Obadak dynasty or something, um, I don't have my notes in front of me, so I apologize. But uh, they have a copper and green with silver accents scheme. So this is what I intended and wanted the Necrons to be sporting. Normally Necrons, for those who don't know, uh, are just sort of bolt gun metal. They're just steel. They're supposed to be the easiest army to paint for good reason, um, since they're usually one color. But this color scheme was a little bit different. It's a little bit more cupric, a little more iron, and uh, I'm sorry, not iron, more copper colored, which is cool. So uh, that's what we're doing. Um, originally, I colored this the way I normally color, which is that I set the uh, monochrome to an overlay type layer, and then I painted with normal layers the color underneath but that did not stick and when it gets to that point that I transition I will let you know color in all the parts of the guy takes a while I hope you don't mind if I sing because there's nothing you can do about it but uh, yeah, coloring takes a long time. And as you can see, I'm not coloring using the actual color. What I'm doing is I fill the entire canvas with the color, and then I paint it in using a mask. Now you're going to ask yourself, why is he doing it that way? Why didn't he just paint it in normally? Well, silly. The reason is that if I use a color and I paint, and then I want to change it later or go back, and add more color somewhere, I have to turn off all my layers and sample that color versus I can just use a mask and paint it in willy-nilly or take it out however I please. And if I want to change all the colors in the canvas that are that on that mask, all I have to do is select the layer and then use the hue saturation slider. Totally sweet, totally easy. And totally digital. If you said this to a color theorist or a traditional painter, they would probably throw up because it is so not the way to normally do things with traditional media. It's actually kind of inconceivable. Though I bet a spray paint artist would understand because they use masks. Anyway... We're still coloring. Um, yeah, a lot of coloring. I apologize. Coloring takes a long time, and it's really not that exciting to watch. At least I don't find it that exciting to watch. You're not really seeing that much change. But you can see what I'm talking about um, when I say that certain colors have inherent values. Um, 
the second I add color, some of the composition seems to change. The values get altered because hue alters value to an extent. Not to mention the fact that I'm using normal layers and I'm overlaying on top of them. That has a big effect as well. Doing the uh, polished steel here. And look, I went back. Perfect example. Went back, started doing this part. Didn't have to paint it in or resample anything. Just used the uh, layer mask. Nice and easy. So while I'm coloring, I guess I'll pose some questions to the viewing audience. Please leave a comment in the comment section of the video if you'd like to chime in. So my next painting is for another client. Um, it's going to be a Terminator of a custom chapter, so more 40k art. Now, I know I have a lot of viewers who aren't necessarily 40k enthusiasts and are saying, well, this is cool, but I don't really care about this stuff. I want to see stuff I care about. Well, that's a good point. So, what kind of stuff are you interested in seeing? Um, I am interested in knowing because I'd like to provide paintings which are more interesting to be viewed. Uh, also, I'm especially curious about what my female audience would like to see. Uh, my male audience, I believe, is a large majority. It's like probably 80%, 85% of my audience is male. And I'd like to be able to uh, appeal more to the female crowd because I don't want anyone to feel excluded. So. If you are female and you're watching this video, leave a comment. I'd really like to know what you'd like to see, um, and I don't want to just jump on stereotypes or whatever and say, well, girls like fairies and unicorns, right? Well, all right, I'll do some of those, because I know that's not true, though I'm sure there are some girls who like fairies and unicorns, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, so please leave a comment. I'd, I'm really curious, honestly, um, and I do read all the comments. I don't necessarily answer all of them. Uh, some comments, like... I, I do appreciate the ones where people say awesome art, etc. I read it, I smile, um, so I hear you, but um, a lot of those types of comments don't necessarily warrant responses. So if you say something really nice to me, believe me, I appreciate it, um, but I'm trying to spend my time answering questions and helping people. But don't stop saying nice things, I like nice comments too. They make my day. Um, so yeah. I do read the comments, so if you do post something on this video about what you'd like to see, I will read it, and if I think it's a cool idea, and I have time to do it, I will do it. With that said, however, um, <laughs> walking a thin line here, uh, I don't do requests in the sense that if I get a comment from someone saying, hey, can you paint this? Thanks, it really means a lot to me. Um, you're probably not going to see what you want painted, simply because I don't have enough time in my day to do requests uh, if I want to pay the bills and eat. Uh, remember, this is my job. This isn't something I do for fun. I do enjoy painting, but this is my work. So to give you an idea, if you went into you know, an auto mechanics body shop and said, hey, can you fix my brakes? You like doing that, right? That's like what you do for fun. Well, they might enjoy working on cars, but they also have to go home and feed their families, so keep that in mind. Uh, requests are great, but I don't take them. If you're interested in seeing something really specifically done, you can always commission me. I have pretty reasonable rates, and I'm willing to work on payment plans uh, and talk to you about your idea and figure out something with you. Um, however, in this specific situation, I am taking requests in that I would like to know what people would like to see tutorials of, or subject matters painted because I want to know what appeals to you. All right, end of that little deal. Uh, so back to the painting. Right now I'm doing gold, 
using this guy's reference, and I, th I don't know if I'm actually directly color sampling. I try not to color sample. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Also, it's good to be able to determine colors without having to have reference for everything, because you're not always going to have reference available for everything. So, relying on reference is not good, but ignoring reference is even worse. Conflicting messages. All right, doing some of the wiring and undersuit stuff now. This is why I love layers so much, because I can paint with impunity. Don't have to worry about it going over the gold, as the gold is on a higher layer. Okay, sweet. Doing some red for the lanyard. Gonna have to desaturate it a little bit in a second. It's a little bit too vibrant. There you go. Um, remember, it's the grim darkness of the far future, not the vibrant, colorful World of Warcraft style darkness of the far future. <laughs> And doing some more laurels and going over the text. Devils in the details. And doing some metal for the battle damage. I do like the sort of chewed up looking armors of marines though. It has a lot more character and f kind of story in it than factory new suits of power armor. Alright, doing some parchment now. As I'm sure you guys have noticed, for the ones who are still tuned in, this is a little bit of a longer tutorial. Usually my painting tutorials are about an hour long, 50 minutes to an hour, because I know people have attention spans of about 10 minutes, and sitting for their, an entire hour listening to me talk is not most people's idea of fun. So this one's a little bit longer, so sorry if you like short tutorials. Um, I guess you can skip around, you don't have to listen to everything I say. But uh, I also get requests on the other hand for full true length tutorials, which I don't know if I'll ever be able to do. Uh, the reason is that some of my paintings take, you know, 16 hours, 20 hours, and I really don't feel like narrating for 20 hours. That seems really intense. Not to mention that wouldn't even fit on a DVD, I don't think. It'd be massive. All right, painting in the standard bearer. Another nice thing about aerial perspective uh, is that things in the distance, as I've said before, become less saturated and have less detail. So they don't require as much coloring and attention to detail, which is really refreshing after you've worked on some foreground and midground characters who are overly rendered and detailed. Now I'm trying to figure out the foreground and background colors. Um, I'm really, really working hard to avoid having brown compositions. I got some critique at the Massive Black Workshop saying that my paintings were too dark and too brown, um, which is true. A lot of them are very dark and very brown. And part of that is because I use such contrasting warm and cool highlights that you get like orange highlights cool shadows, blue shadows, and you end up getting this kind of homogenized brown color. So I'm trying really hard to 
kind of have a limited palette when I work. And this was a perfect example or a perfect opportunity for it because Necrons are notoriously green. Uh, they have all these green crystals and green lightning and green lights. So this was a good chance to just sort of limit my palette to a more green uh, chroma. And as you can see, the monolith has that copper tone to it, as do the warriors. But the further away they get from the viewer, the less saturated they become. They start fading out to that kind of green expanse. Oh, as you can see, I've also changed my layer types. Uh, I believe now the monochrome, the original sketch, is on the bottom. And it's a normal layer type, as you can see la uh, labeled in the layer menu. Uh, all of the colors are now in a folder with the hue, I think, layer type. It's either hue or color. I think it's hue. But uh, in a second, when I scroll up, you'll be able to see it. But uh, the reason I did that was I was worried about the values of the normal layers affecting the composition. Uh, I didn't want them messing up my highly orchestrated and thought out uh, tonal study in monochrome. So I decided the best way to do it would be to have them affect just the hue versus the uh, brightness. Getting some of that green lightning going. Green lightning is sweet. I don't even care if you disagree. It is totally awesome. Not something you see in nature, at least to my knowledge. But it looks really good with this color scheme. Copper and green go together. Warm and cool. I couldn't decide on a background color because I have a lot of colors going on here. I have the blue ultramarine, the copper colored overlord, the green of the light source, or the uh, necron tech. So it's just sort of like, well, okay, I've got blue, pinkish red, and green. So do I want yellow, or do I just want to have an entire spectrum of color? That kind of goes against the whole chroma idea of the limited palette. So I think I ended up going with a yellowish green and then tinted everything. Uh, yeah. So the colors are all color layer type uh, in a folder, and the monochrome is a normal layer type underneath. Okay, now I've compressed and flattened everything, and I'm going in with some color dodge, like you do, for extra highlight attention. In this case, we're using a kind of olive green, and we're color dodging using a layer mask. And this is really more for kind of localized light sources, but... It'll get uh it'll get applied to other stuff, don't worry. But it's really great for having these sort of like blown out details like zap, this is a super bright lightning bolt and it's blinding your face. I also like how if you have a color dodge layer and you erase out parts of your brushwork it almost leaves this sort of ethereal ghostly look to it which is good for Necrons because they've got the whole undead thing going all right time for some pinpricks some extreme highlights using the uh, green color dodge layer Very fancy. And this is really, in my opinion, where the painting starts to come alive. My two favorite parts of the painting process are when the monochrome is done and then when the rendering is done, when the painting's actually finished. Um, because all that stuff in between is awkward self doubt time. When you're working and you say, Oh my god, this looks terrible. What am I doing? This is never going to look right. Oh geez, oh geez. Because you don't know, I mean, you know it's going to be okay in the end, but until you get there, it's really hard to <laughs> remember that. You just look at all the flaws and all the work you have to do, and you start getting overwhelmed. So 
when that starts to happen, there's two things you can do. One, take a break, chill out, think about something else, and then go back. Or two, just grind through it. Put some good tunes on, get a refreshing beverage, and just start rendering. Really, you know, Essentially, when I get to this stage, I like to think of myself as a robot, kind of like on a uh, working on in Maya or computer rendering Maya 3D sequences. I'm not even thinking about it. I'm taking into account where the light is coming from, but I'm just sort of working formulaically, following a lighting algorithm in my head. I'm saying, okay, light source is here, it hits here, blah 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 blah. Just go. Don't think about it. Just sort of tromp along, grind through it. It'll get done eventually. It's going to take work. It's going to take time, but just got to do it. Also, this green highlight is totally sweet on the uh, metal and blue armor. It's kind of ghostly and otherworldly. It makes the ultramarine seem really out of his element, like something's wrong. Because ultramarines are nice guys. They should have warm light sources, sunny skies. Whereas now it's this kind of overcast, greenish, ghoulish light. Something's not right. Oh, geez. So you can see here, I was still trying to figure things out. And look, I caught myself. I almost made it to brown. Look how brown this painting is right now, right? Oh, that was a little tweak, by the way, just to explain what's happening. The perspective was a little bit off on the staff. It was bothering me. Um, so see how brown and like reddish this was? That was going against the whole point. The whole point I had was limited color palette favoring green. Also, I was tempted by the evils of warm bounce light. Warm bounce light is a go-to of, I don't know what to do at this point, and it would look sweet if he was standing on lava. That is one of the most used, I guess, tropes, you could say, in painting, especially digital painting. Um, don't know what to do? Warm bounce light. Yeah. But uh, I actually ended up nuking it a little bit. It's still warm, but it's not that kind of glowing hot lava warm because I, I didn't want to go that way. The explosion is hot, but it's not that hot. In terms of color temperature, that is. I'm not sure how, how physically hot it is. I'm sure it's quite toasty, as lightning and fire tend to be. Um, what was fun about this, too, is you can use color dodges. This actually reminded me of some of my older paintings when I was doing dragons and stuff. Uh, um, but uh, I like using color dodge layers sort of for fire. It's really fun to do, and you'll see how I do it here. I have kind of a, I just have a round brush, normal brush, and I paint in these sort of swirls and whatnot, and then I go in with, this is all using a, a layer mask, and I kind of pull and push it out and add this volume to the fire and these kind of tracing whirls of gas and lightning and stuff, and it's just a blasty blast to do. Oh, I love it. I love doing that. Sweetness. Look how scary that lightning is. It's got so much pow and zap to it. And mushroom cloud time. Mushroom clouds are uh, interesting to paint um, because it's fire behaving in a 3D space. I mean, fire is always 3D, but you know, mushroom clouds have a very distinctive volume form, and it's interesting to paint because it actually has its own properties that need to be taken into consideration when painting it. Um, you know, you have this glowing gas that's forming it, so it almost works inversely to normal lighting situations um, but at the same time I, I can't like it casts shadows on itself it's weird it's like fire and smoke casting shadows on themselves it's a uh, kind of actually difficult to paint and of course it's got inner luminescence since it's hot and glowing 
So, uh, challenge. Challenging to paint. At least for me. I'm sure people are laughing at this saying, you can't do mushroom clouds. Are you kidding me? But I can, see? Look, I did it right there. Oh man, after an hour, this tutorial just sort of gets watered down by my ranting. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's how I paint fire using color dodge layers and um, color dodge layers and masks. And now I'm applying that warmer lighting. And here I had a fun idea of doing some really blue highlights. Um, I it ended up being too strong, but it was just really crazy and fun. <laughs> it reminds me of that chick from Hellboy with the blue fire. Totally cool. But uh, I ended up toning it down a little bit. It was too saturated. It was too blue. So I had to keep it more green. But now you can see the limited palette. It's not really brown anymore. It's sort of this olivey green color. This rich, ghostly green. Work in the atmospheric perspective using a lighten layer. Lighten is good for atmospheric perspective. And funny enough, so is darken. Um, darken layers can be useful. If you're trying to limit the contrast in a foreground element, you can use a darken layer. Or if you're trying to tame an overly highlighted uh, item, uh, object in the background, you can use a darken layer. For, select it. A similar color that you'd like and limit its brightness. Very useful. Uh, here I'm going back with the color dodge and I'm sort of doing this flash effect on the front of the monolith, um, which is kind of fun. It helps define its volume really well. And remember, these are just monoliths, these are just photographs of the miniatures painted up and prettied up. I wouldn't do that on a miniature of an infantryman, just because they use heroic scale. I'd have to tweak it a lot, but for vehicles, it generally is okay. Um, here I'm adding some more details to the clouds. I thought that that area was just sort of nebulous and needed something, so we've got this sort of cool eye of the storm type deal going on, where the clouds are all focusing around a point off screen, where this giant column of smoke is rising. Almost like a portal a little bit. And here we're using more light and layers to differentiate the Necron Warriors from the uh, foreground elements. And when in doubt, time for more detailing. This time we're using normal layers, just sampling the nearby areas and uh, that's it. Fast and dirty. Because he's an overlord, he needs more details. Um, also adding some blues and gold, very Egyptian looking. And I'm using multiply layers, actually. As you can see, um, I just erased out the area that I wanted to be brighter. That's all I did. Since multiply layers can only darken your image. And doing some more color dodging, some rim lights and bounce light, random details, because I can. And once again, he's a royalty, he's a Necron overlord, he needs more detail. More little designs and pretty stuff on his armor. And it looks pretty sweet, if I do say so myself. Might as well make the marble veining pop a little bit. Add some doodads to the rest of the armor, his little engravings. Because he's got pride, damn it. He's got to be the best on the battlefield. I don't know what I'm doing right now. Oh, right. I'm establishing. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm establishing a little bit of a horizon, but it was too low. So, trying to find those. I don't remember earlier I did some sort of canyony mountainy things in the background 
and I thought they were were important, so I tried to add them back. Also, I uh, focused on strengthening the whole tunnel effect. And I believe lastly, I hinted that there's a monolith closer because those Necron warriors in the midground, the ones walking in front of the explosion, uh, they were just sort of isolated and it seemed weird. So I added a hint of a monolith there just to make it seem like they had something near them and that the mushroom cloud was you know, actually in a place in space. And lastly, you can see I'm using the shrapnel brush here with a normal layer just to add some uh, little debris. Uh, here I'm using a curve layer to balance out the various contrasts and brightnesses as well as a contrast layer, contrast brightness layer to uh, make the explosions desaturate and pop. So that's the end of this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, please leave comments and questions in the comment section of the video. I read all your comments. Uh, if I find that you've commented or asked a really important question, I'll make sure to answer it. Um, thanks again for watching. I'll have some more videos coming out soon. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and share it with your friends.